Hello, San Francisco. So, uh, as Annetta said, we at Odd Salon kind of tend towards the doomy, the goth adjacent. So, uh, raise your hand if you uh, consider yourself a wearer of black. <laughs> so, I, I have some bad news. This is actually not going to be a doomy talk, actually. So, this is going to be a little bit more about overcrowding, sexy new technology, and the dangers of overplanning. <laughs> If there are any product managers in the, in the house, I'm sorry about the Gantt chart. <laughs> okay, so this is also a little bit different from the Litquake one, guys, so, you know, hold on to your butts. So, between 1880, uh, 1800 and 1850, uh, the population of London more than doubled, uh, which caused a huge number of problems. Um, and since the population of the Bay Area just about doubled since uh, 1980, I'm sure a lot of you feel that pain right now. You can imagine what this feels like. So in the 1830s, London was kind of balanced, uh, you know, on the precipice between the medieval city of its past and the modern city of its future. Uh, booming mechanization from the Industrial Revolution both displaced agricultural workers, it took away their jobs, and then sucked them into the cities where all the jobs were. Um, and the cities were really, really crowded, and they were living in literally medieval tenement buildings, and I mean literally as in actually literally, because that is a building that was built in the 1600s. Okay, early modern, anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, semantics. Um, <laughs> yes, I am, thank you. Uh, <laughs> London was really poorly suited for this. Uh, there were no municipal waste programs. You know, who, who here is tired of paying the trash man? Yeah, but you know, the, the, op the opposite issue is worse. So both sewage and trash were heaped in the streets, which is a little like New York, um, and then ran down the streets into the waterways, and they just became open sewers. Um, this also goes for food waste, for runoff from butchers, from fishmongers, everything. Um, so disease was really, really common, and pathogens kind of ended up in the water supply. Um, infection, illness, and premature death were really rampant. So with a housing squeeze for the living, you're not surprised to see that there's also a housing squeeze for the dead. Um, for centuries in London, residents had been buried in the yard of their parish church. Um, and when older graves were disturbed, the bones were just removed and placed uh, respectfully into a charnel house. Um, and I should mention that uh, cremation was not actually legalized in Britain until like the 1860s. So, with a booming population, this system completely broke down. So a coffin might be, re might be buried one week and disturbed you know, three or six weeks later uh, to make room for a new occupant. So charnel houses were stuffed with half-rotted body parts. Ew. And many graves were just emptied and the contents scattered on the street. Yeah. Good time. So churches began to dig mass graves where they just kind of threw the corpses in their winding sheets and then they'd scatter a bit of lime and dirt and wait for the next one. Um, to the point where the soil level in several Victorian churchyards around London actually rises feet above street level because of the amount of material placed in it. Yeah, so the worst part actually is that this isn't a new problem. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a new call out for tonight. This is a map. Yes. Thank you. So in the 1830s, Parliament actually saw this coming, and so they passed a series of acts encouraging the establishment of larger suburban cemeteries on the outskirts of uh, the, the city to try and take the pressure off these parish churchyards before they were really bursting. Um, so they built a bunch of posh, monumental uh, cemeteries around the fringes of the city, um, and then they were soon like in swallowed. The city grew around them. So they're like, oh, it's on the outskirts. Oh, not anymore, sorry. Um, their classical landscaping was beautiful and it was hygienic, but it was also entirely beyond the means of the most vulnerable populations. And this was underscored by the recurrence of cholera, which uh, repeatedly devastated the slums in London. So the 1884 epidemic killed 14,000 people in a single year. Um, and this was before the uh, 1854 one, which killed another 600 people, uh, and which became famous because of the epidemiological maps of Jon Snow. <laughs> maps, yes. So um, these posh cemeteries, which were nicknamed by a later historian, the Magnificent Seven, after the Western, so it's not a historical name, guys, um, they just weren't doing the trick. 
Um, and in this environment, Londoners got totally desensitized. So grave diggers sold bodies to medical men for dissection uh, and for study. They sold up broken up coffin wood as fuel for poor homes. They collected the bones, human and animal, and sold them to be burnt to make fertilizer in the country. Um, churchyards actually belched methane. They had like no smoking in the churchyard uh, rules. Um, and then there, there was like liquid goo coming out of the rocks, and yet people still came to London, and people still died, so something had to be done. In 1850, Parliament passed the Burial Acts, which actually forbade the internment of bodies in the inner city churchyards, uh, attempting them to divert them to the suburbs. Um, prices skyrocketed, people protested, the poor buried their dead in violation of the law, occasionally in the basement. Um, and general uproar ensued, and so realizing their mistake, Parliament made emergency provisions to help the poor bury their dead outside the city where, you know, while it came up with a plan, like, they're gonna, they're gonna run a Kickstarter to get you the grave that you needed. Um, so plan one was to acquire, yes. Plan one was to acquire and nationalize the Magnificent Seven. It failed miserably when the insanely profitable cemeteries named their selling price. Plan two was some guy in Parliament said, hey, we'll just take the dead bodies and use them as landfill. We'll just do, pull a marina on it. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, he was laughed out. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was expensive. Um, finally, a third proposal was made, and it was basically the like, government's going to run a startup. So the plan was to use railroads, which were the Bitcoin of the time. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, there's a lot of people going out of business because of it. You know, there's that game Speculation. It's a card game. You should, you should check it out. Uh, <laughs> so these were the sexy new technology of the time, and they were going to use this to uh, enable them to build a cemetery 25 miles outside the city in an area of ground so distant as to be beyond any f possible future extension of the capital. Spoilers. <laughs> They just barely made it. <laughs> uh, the current cemetery is now only seven miles from the M25, which is the unofficial boundary of London. Um, it was a full day's journey by horse-drawn conveyance, so railroads were really important. But because the government didn't actually want to own any startup assets, um, the big part of it was that they were going to mooch off the business, the London and Southwestern Railway com Company, and then just run trains on their lines. So it's like your ISP leasing fiber from Google. Basically that. Yeah, so we have Brookwood Cemetery, the London necropolis. So the cemetery was to be laid out in a naturalistic parkland style, very fashionable as a reaction to industrialization. Um, and it was you know, popularized by landscape architects like William Olmsted, who was the designer of New York Central Park. Uh, the cemetery was going to uh, cover 15 100 acres, which for reference, uh, Golden Gate Park is 1,000 acres. And at a conservative estimate of one, one deep, one grave per, uh, per spot, they said it could uh, accommodate 5.8 million burials and take 350 years to fill. So, such a monumental <laughs> undertaking. I know, it's bad. Dad joke, dad joke, I'm ashamed. Uh, it immediately drew really a lot of suspicion and criticism and politicking and politicians proceeded to do what they did best, which was uh, regulate and uh, yeah, yeah, make, uh, make uh, affordances. So when it was finally approved, the London Necropolis and National Mausoleum Company had the most badass logo. Like it needs to go on the back of a biker jacket. Um, but they were faced with regulations for the prices they could charge for tickets, for burials. They were forbidden from carrying anything other than corpses and legitimate mourners. They were forbidden from creating mass graves and forbidden from selling off the land for development. And so this attracted a certain type of people. And by the time the pro proposal was approved, the original designers had sold the IP to trustees who were just dumbasses. Uh, they wasted 18 months scrabbling, squabbling, squabbling among themselves. Count <laughs> Not a map, you're right. <laughs> um, and they, they wasted a huge amount of money. So in, instead of the 1,500 acres, the trustees were like, oh, you know what would be better than 1,500 is 2,200. Yeah. So they bought a bunch of 
otherwise unusable land in Surrey and set aside 400 uh, acres to start. They were ridiculously in debt and the delay allowed parish priests to find time to figure out other ways to deal with the dead bodies. You know, you have 18 months of dead people piling up, you're not gonna wait for the government to finish the cemetery. Um, at that point, they had bailouts. They had government bailouts. They had acts of parliament that uh, gave them loans and funding. And basically, like, this is one of those arguments for governments not running startups. Despite all of this, the cemetery opened in 1854, and during its heyday, there were three classes of tickets that you could purchase for three different classes of, <laughs> classes of burials. Um, so the railway carriages were segregated both into Anglicans and nonconformists. <laughs> yep. And also by ticket class. And then also the hearses were segregated too. <laughs> yeah, good times. Um, so the train left London every day of the week at 11.30 from Waterloo Station on the south bank of the Thames. Um, the idea being that corpses could be cheaply transported by water to the morgue and mourners could get there because it's the middle of the, the transit system. The other reason was because Waterloo was the only line that could get to the cemetery without going through a tunnel and even back then nobody wanted to ride in a train in the dark with a bunch of dead bodies. <laughs> so the London Necropolis Company was actually pretty modern and they were vertically integrated. So they ran funeral dir directory uh, offices in the city, they had chapels of all denominations, they ran a florist shop and a bunch of greenhouses, they had stone cutters on site, and you could also buy a picnic lunch at the station to be had after the interment. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, after, uh, after that, the, city, the train would return to the city at 2.30 p.m., and because they allowed services on Sunday, which was something that was not allowed anywhere else, um, they became really popular with actors and the poor because you didn't have to take time off work. Um, so Sundays were the only day required, by, uh, uh, required as a day of rest, and so even during this period, uh, even the theaters were closed at this time. So um, this is the, the, the map of, yep. And, and I'd like to point out there's actors, and Swedes, and odd fellows. We, we have our, our destiny. <laughs> so this ran into trouble though, because this like started in, in the 18, early 1850s. Um, by the 1880s, the train cars were, that had been so sexy were now hopelessly outdated. And people stopped using them because they'd rather have a nicer horse-drawn hearse. But as luck would have it, with the continued growth of the London population, our good friends, the, no the London and Southwestern line needed to expand, and they couldn't do this with the Necropolis Railway Terminus right up against their track bed. So the LNC did what any business did, and they took the money and ran, and they milked <laughs> their neighbor for everything they could. <laughs> Capitalism. <laughs> um, they, the LNC agreed to the proposals in return, uh, for the railroad granting them control of the design of the new station, uh, leasing for the new station at a token rent for uh, per perpetuity, uh, providing new train cars, removing any limit on the number of passengers who could use them, providing free carriage of machinery and equipment, and in addition, providing them 12,000 pounds, which is about 1.3 in modern money, um, of compensation for them moving their office over. So I, I thought about this for a bit, and I'm like, this can't be that big of an expansion. So this is actually a map of Waterloo Station uh, yeah, um, before the expansion. And then this is approximately where the uh, Necropolis line was. And uh, this is what it looked like after uh, the movement. And it's funny because it grew and expanded to fill that. And this is what it looks like today. So it grew and shrank and grew and shrank and grew and shrank. And now there's a hotel where that dead people station was. Ooh, good times. So despite all of this, the London Necropolis Company was never profitable. So of the 500,000 burials they expected in the first 100 years, only 200,000 had been buried by the end of operations in 1945. The trains were hard to maintain and modernize, and by the 1930s, everyone wanted a, an automobile. They wanted to be carried off in the newer, sexier mode of transit. Hearse, yeah. So the death knell for the company was during the Blitz. Uh, the train was on the track when a V1 bomb struck it, 
and they kind of like figured out an arrangement with their good old nemesis, the London and Southwestern line. But when the war ended in 1945, they're like, wow, this is way too expensive to maintain. So the trustees looked at the costs and decided to close and decided to do it in true capitalist fashion. They sold the company off to private owners who stripped it of all of its valuable assets and sold them off. Um, and then abandoned the, the, the entire cemetery with all the graves and the stones until the 1980s when a local group bought it back and um, brought it back into use as a hallowed ground for minority communities. And in 2014, the cooperative actually turned the cemetery back uh, over to the Woking Town Co Council in Surrey. Uh, and these are some pictures of it in its beautiful decay. This is as goth as it gets in this presentation. Yeah. So today, only two remnants of the original Necropolis Railway remain. So the main office, which served as a sometime station, and the two iron pillars um, of the old terminus south of the Waterloo Station, which are right next to an extremely posh toilet showroom. I'm not even joking. <laughs> yeah, Google Maps, man. Um, so with that, I'd like to end with a toast using the motto of this lovely thing, uh, Mortis Chius Viva Salus, peace for the dead and health for the living. <laughs>